We begin the news uh, with the update on the crash that killed the group chief executive officer of Access Holdings PLC, Herbert Wigwe. The authorities in the United States of America have shared details of the crash on board the ill-fated aircraft late Friday, where Wigwe, his wife and son, a former group chairman of the Nigeria Exchange Group, Bimbola Ogumbanjo, as well as two crew members. U.S. authorities in a briefing on Sunday said reports suggest that a wintry con weather condition was among the factors that contributed to the chopper crash that claimed the six lives. At the briefing, a National Transport Safety Board member, Michael Graham, said officials were at the scene to gather perishable evidence. The accident include... The crew consisted of a pilot in command and a safety pilot. The accident flight was operated by Orbic Air LLC as a Part 135 charter flight. Witness reports of the weather conditions at the time of the accident suggest rain and a wintry mix. The, heli the helicopter was not equipped with a cockpit voice recorder or a flight data recorder. This helicopter was not required to be equipped with those type of recording devices. We are aware of media reports of some downed power lines near the accident site. We will be looking into this report during our on-scene investigative, investigative. In the meantime, Nigeria's President Bolatin who has mourned the tragic death of two senior members of the Nigeria business community, as we just mentioned there. Uh, group Chief Executive Officer of How Access Holdings, PLC, Herbert Wigwe, and former Group Chairman of the Nigerian Exchange Group, PLC, Bimola Gubanjo, in a helicopter crash in the United States of America, along with his wife, Chizoba, and their son, as well as two crew members. In a statement released on Sunday, February 11, by his special advice on media and publicity, President Tinubu described the tragic accident as an overwhelming tragedy that was shocking beyond comprehension. Well, to further discuss this really sad uh, story, and uh, we're joined by Chief Executive Officer of the Center for the Promotion of Private Enterprise, Mr. Uh, Dr. Muda Yusuf. Dr. Yusuf, it's good to have you, albeit in very um, uh, tragic and sad circumstances. Uh, uh, how will you um, uh, describe, most people watching right now already know whoever Wigwe was, but as a person, and as a professional in the world of business, how do you describe him? Well, uh, first of all, let me commiserate with the family and the entire uh, corporate world and the entire nation, actually, because this is a national loss. It's a very tragic loss. Uh, how about Ugwe and uh, Ogumba and Joe, who are very... Uh, Prominent players in the corporate in the corporate world, uh, in the banking system, for instance, about about who was you know the CEO of Access Holding, Access Bank today as that last year has the largest asset size uh, among all the banks. It has an asset size of uh, over twenty trillion, so it's easily the biggest bank today. And that shows the kind of leadership it brought uh, to the financial system, to the banking system. And that also demonstrates the kind of impact that the bank was having on, on, the, on the business environment and on the economy generally. Then beyond that, he was also playing, he also played very critical roles outside the banking system. Uh, during COVID, for instance, he was one of the frontliners in mobilizing the private sector you know, to tackle the challenge of COVID. He was a leader, I mean, of the business coalition against AIDS. And I know that the bank has also supported quite a number of private sector investment in the health sector, you know, to stem the challenges of all this uh, medical tourism and all of that. So he, he has played a very, very big, big role in the economy, uh, in the private sector, in the health sector. And only recently, he has uh, commenced very major, a major investment in the educational sector, you know, through the Wigge, Wigge University. And uh, from the way he was coming up, I mean, we are going to see an a, a university of uh, of international standard. You know, he has 
set a very high standard for that university, was already doing a lot. I mean, this two school has started, and unfortunately, we have this incident. Then we also heard from the aviation sector that he was also leading uh, a commitment to be able to change the ambience of our airports. You know what our airport is currently, particularly international airports, sometimes it can be very embarrassing. We are going to change the ambience of the airport. So it shows the kind of person he was. You know, beyond just making profits, he also has his footprints you know, right. in other sectors of the economy. So, so Mura Yusuf, having said that, um, Wigwe, as a person who you know, was uh, active beyond the world of banking, uh, how big is the loss of Herbert Wigwe to Nigeria and also the loss of Ogobanjo as well? So it's, it's a very big loss because when you lose your, your leaders, because he's a leader in his own rights, both himself and Ogumpanjo, they were, you know, frontliners as far as uh, the private sector is concerned. And we all know the role of private sector in the development of an economy in terms of contribution to job creation, to investment growth, to revenue generation for government, and to partnership. Because the economy is so that the, the government cannot do it alone. And these two gentlemen have been playing a very big role within the framework of public-private partnership, mobilizing our private resources to support the initiatives of government across all the critical sectors. So these are the kind of these, these are the kind of uh, persons that you have lost to this this tragic uh, incident. Mm. Uh, Murray Yosef, he, he moved on a bit to become a non-executive director of Access Bank and uh, to become the uh, uh, group CEO of Access Holdings. Um, I mean, obviously, this is a very difficult time for his family, uh, his loved ones, his associates, his friends, and indeed for Nigerians, for Herbert Wigwe's family. Um, but um, uh, how was the bank expected to, and the group expected to survive um, since corporate governance, you know, is, is part of this conversation? Do you think that this will be a challenge for the organization going forward? Um, someone asked me yesterday if she needs to withdraw her money from Access Bank. I know it's a trying time and we are all mourning, but these are questions that, you know, some are asking. So we have to ask you these questions. So, um, you know, are we saying that corporate, corporate governance is already in place and all, all is taken care of, or you think it's going to be a trying time for his corporate organization? No, not at all, not at all. These are institutions that are, that are built on very solid foundation. Uh, they have excellent succession uh, planning framework. Uh, they have excellent corporate governance. Uh, so really, this is, doesn't pose any risk at all. Uh, to the sustenance of the institution, to the stability of the institution, to the growth of the institution. Uh, they, these are, they, I mean, they have, they have very solid foundation in terms of corporate structure. So there is no risk at all uh, to, to the institution uh, and to all the investment that, that uh, these two gentlemen uh, are pioneering or have put in place. Is so it too soon to, are, to begin to expect? Uh, is it too soon to begin to expect the board of access holdings to announce a replacement? Well, within a few weeks, that will happen. I mean, I mean, the, the system has to continue. Uh, I mean, there should be continuity. Within a week or two, we should they should announce. That does not take anything away from the mood and from the commiseration and from the general you know, a condolence environment or mourning environment that all of us as a country, as Nigerians are feeling. It doesn't take anything away from that. Okay. Obviously, like we said, of course, a very difficult time for his family, associates, friends, and for all Nigerians. But the question on the lips of a lot of people out there is what the fate of his legacy project, Wigwe University, uh, being built, right, as we speak, in Ishiopo, in the Korea local government area of River State, and what the fate will be following his demise. What do you expect to happen to Wigwe University going forward, from what you know? Well, he has very reliable associates, and uh, he's also an institutional person. These are people who have built institutions. So I'm sure this is not just about him as an individual. It's also about the institution that he represents. It's about the values, the vision that he has. 
And I'm sure he's not doing this alone as a person. He has that corporate support, corporate structure to support the realization of his vision. So I don't see any major risk uh, to some of the visions, including the university and some other investments that he has. All right. Um, Dr. Muda Yusuf, uh, thank you so very kindly, albeit in difficult circumstances, uh, for your time this evening. Thank you very much. My pleasure. The Nigerian government has responded to the threat issued by organized labor to declare a nationwide strike in the next two weeks. The Nigerian government said that it had so far demonstrated good faith in implementing the agreement it had with the workers over cushioning the hardship occasioned by the removal of the subsidy on petrol. Addressing a press conference in Abuja, Minister of State for the Federal Ministry of Labor and Employment in Kiruka Onye Jeocha said President Bola Timbo's administration was tirelessly working to ensure that everything was done to address the needs and concerns of the nation. Well, to further discuss this, I'm joined by public affairs commentator Benga Ayanuga. Benga, good evening. It's good to have you uh, on the news tonight. Let's begin by asking you what the key factors, uh, what key factors rather have contributed to the current plight uh, of Nigerian workers, and um, how do these factors affect their overall well-being and uh, job satisfaction? Thank you for having me. Uh, a lot of factors basically have contributed to the present situation that we have found ourselves, one being the uh, proclamation by the president when he came to office and declared that uh, subsidy is gone. Even though we know that subsidy have been removed by the uh, previous administration, but the previous administration planned to phase out subsidy by uh, June, and that's June ending. And he came in May 29 and said subsidy is gone. And because of the abrupt way and manner that uh, his declaration led to a lot of ripple effect that led to the increase in price, made a lot of things become instantaneously difficult for all Nigerians because nobody was prepared. Everybody was planning towards, you know, a uh, gradual shift towards that June ending that the previous administration had made plan for. Coupled with the uh, floating of the FX rate that made the Naira to jump all the way from about 500 naira, uh, 600 naira there about that he met it to about 1,500 naira now at the uh, black market. All these things coupled together uh, made life difficult, not just for the workers who are in government employ or private employ, but everyday citizen who had to transact and buy uh, food. Uh, let me bring it to light. Before, okay, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Benga, the, I, I'm sincerely you know, sorry FX to interject. Happened. I'm so sorry. We, we will take a short break. And when we come back, we want to ask you some more questions. Also, give a chance to continue uh, with the point you're making. Please stay with us. Welcome back. You're still watching New Central now, uh, right here on New Central TV. Nigeria, of course, uh, the Nigerian government responding to the threat issued by organized labor uh, to declare a nationwide strike in the next two weeks. All about the economic situation in the country. Uh, of course, the government's promise to give uh, the, the, the salaries, uh, uh, wage increases or wage awards to workers uh, under its employ, which the Labour says the agreement signed between it, Labour, and the government has not been uh, fully implemented by the Nigerian government. Well, the Nigerian government latest has said that um, it has demonstrated good faith in implementing that agreement it reached with uh, the Labour centres, NLC and TUC. Our guests tonight, um, we have... Uh, uh, public Affairs uh, Commentator Benga Ayanuga joins us via video link. Uh, Benga, before we're at the break, you were uh, making some points. I just want to quickly ask you, how has the, uh, the labor centers, how have the labor centers in Nigeria uh, addressed, been instrumental in addressing the concern of Nigerian workers, maybe even those in the private sector? Um, your thoughts on this? Uh, well, uh, uh, the labor has been very careful. The fact that due to their uh, active participation in the last election and the fact that at the beginning of this whole issue, when things were not as bad as this, 
uh, rather than majority of the masses to support the labor, they felt the labor is polarized politically, hence the support was not uh, that much. So the labor has been very careful. But now, with the uh, impromptu strikes that are been coming out from different states, starting with uh, Niger State last week, followed by Nasarawa, Kano, uh, Oshun State, and uh, and so on. So they've seen that now the people are tired of the status quo and the people really want uh, the change. So that is why I, I believe the labor is picking up. But on the analysis of how bad the situation is, as at when this government came to power in uh, May 2023, 20, uh, at 600 naira, let's assume the dollar was 600 naira because I know it was uh, between 500 and something to 600 naira as at that time. At 600 naira to a dollar, it means that the average salary per month of the Nigerian workers is about $50, which if you divide it is giving you about uh, $1.70 cents, uh, per day, average worker. But as at today's rate, the average worker salary is about 90 cents. It's not even up to a dollar per day. So, and I don't know how you expect people to cope with, uh, with this. And the inflationary rate is increasing all round. As at when this government came to power, rise was about 31, 32,000 naira. As at this week, rice is 71,000 naira in my own area here. And I heard that in some area, it is 75,000 naira per bag. Uh, I, I bought a, a bag of potato yesterday in order to just uh, look for a way to make sure that I, I prepare for last month. I, I bought it January 1st, there about, or second, there about at 9,000 naira. I bought that same bag of potato for 18,000 naira yesterday. And so this shows to you that the situation is biting hard and the labor uh, organization are seeing that now if they speak, the people will respond because now the people are feeling the pang and they are not waiting for the government. On the comment made by the Honorable Minister uh, Oyen Jocha about the effort of the government, yes, the government is doing a lot of things, but those a lot of things are not showing, you know, um, they intentionally using those a lot of things, you know, to, to show you that uh, we cannot see them. For example, she talked about how the government is preparing for CNG uh, conversion. They have 55,000. They are planning to make 55,000 CNG buses. But my question to her is that if you make 55,000 CNG buses, let's even assume that it is possible and you are able to do it in record fuel stations we have across the country in this whole area where i live between lagos and Ogun state i can only see one one so if you make these buses where are going where are they going to be refueling if we don't have all these infrastructures all right. in place so it right. shows it's, that yeah uh, most of the time the government seems to be planning their build not from the foundation but from the rooftop all right and people know that when matters affect politicians or the political classes they are faster in implementing... Benga, Benga, thank you so much. Just a quick one, uh, because of time. Masses, thank you, Benga. To be Sorry to interject because of time, so we can, we can, we can make good time. What are the potential economic implications of uh, uh, the NLC and NLC and TUC strike, strike for Nigeria if it goes ahead? Uh, well, I don't think it's going to be a win for Nigeria if NLC go on strike, because things are already bad as they are. Now, while the NLC uh, strike might force the hand of the government, but it may also lead us to the unintended effect of uh, sporadic violence across the nation, in the sense that a lot of people who depend on daily wages, whose source of livelihood have been drastically impacted already, they are angry, they have a lot of pent up anger. So when there is a strike, maybe the first day they might agree, by the second, third day, there will be a lot of armed robberies, pocket of armed robberies happening all around and violent hijack of this protest and NLC will not be able to manage the situation. And it is not because they are not competent enough to manage the situation, but because the massive uh, people, number of people who are being affected by this situation will outnumber the effort of the NLC to manage the whole situation. So for me, I believe that the government and the NLC should sit down and find 
a solution without resulting to strike because it is going to affect government too. Government should show goodwill because the uh, wage award that they spoke about, the 35,000 dollar wage award, they said it that they will pay from September to February. This is February. All they right. only paid twice. All right. We Thank you so pay. much. So, I, I mean, by now, we expect that they should have paid like five times. Thank you so much, Benga. I, you know, guys, it's been a pleasure having you uh, on the news this evening. Two ministers of Nigeria's federal government have blamed the current food uh, uh, crisis in the country on unintended consequences of the two reforms introduced by the federal government uh, on the subsidy of petrol and forex, or the exchange rate. Minister of Agriculture Abubakar Kari attributed the food shortage in the country to the devaluation of the Naira, which has made the nation's currency weak compared with the CFA franc. Uh, or the West of the CEFA, the currency used by eight other states in the West African sub-region. Kerry disclosed to the National Assembly in his presentation before the Senate Committees on Finance, Appropriation, Banking, Insurance, and other financial institutions. The minister lamented the devaluation of the Naira uh, had given neighboring countries an advantage to buy cheaper farm products from Nigeria, which are now consequently smuggled across the border by peasants. Earlier, the executive director of Lead Africa Network, Chukuma Kema, was on the news and he shared his thoughts. Uh, the reforms uh, were being adopted, the mannerism with which vote reforms was implemented, it showed that it was not carefully thought out process and enough strategy to mitigate the possible impact it would have been expected that for a subsidy that has been maintained, subsidy regime, and the essence of it, of course, is to stop untold hardship on the citizen due to high cost on importation. It should have been expected that by the, the abrupt removal and the mannerism with which it was done, that will bring untold hardship on the citizen. So I do not see the, 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 the need for the choice of the word unintended consequences. And then also with respect to uh, that of um, uh, 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 the devalu devaluation of the Naira, you know, which have been issue has been backed up by the, the central bank. What would have expected to see on the part of the government would have been first and foremost, boost local production, fix our refineries, ensure that those means where we dissipate even end dollars, you know, for it's, it's on record that for five years, NNPC never paid anything into the Treasury. So all of those things would have been addressed uh, before going on with those uh, two reforms. Cocoa Farmers Association of Nigeria has reported that a fire outbreak has raised up to 30 hectares of farmland in Abia State, Nigeria. And the fire outbreak amid a cocoa price increase uh, could result in a 4% drop in supply. And loss of about 11,000 tons of the chocolate ingredient pod during the meat crop harvest season. In total, the meat crop harvest ranges between 280,000 tons and 300,000 tons. The zonal chairman of the association, John Kalu, said the fires in Abia State were caused by farmers setting lands ablaze as a quick and cost-effective method of clearing the land of weeds and preparation for the upcoming planting season. On the 7th of November 2023, 17 local government chairmen appointed were inaugurated by the Abia State Governor Alex O.T. to manage and control the affairs of the third tier of government. But the appointment generated a lot of reaction due to the array of personalities chosen for the job. It's been three months since the inauguration and New Central's Chinwe Ogele now examines their journey so far and the impact on the grassroots. Four and established persons called up to contribute to the development of their various localities. The expectations of many were that they would hit the ground running after their inauguration to be able to leave impressions after six months. Already the first half of their race is gone and what can the masses say about their leadership so far for you to work well and achieve tangibly 
you must relate with the people you work with them and know, ask them what is their problem, their challenges, and from there you know what they need and what to do. The state government had vowed to give the local government chairman the autonomy they required to execute projects in the rural communities. Efforts to get any of the chairmen to speak about this were unsuccessful. For some people who would not speak on camera, they are still not sure of what their achievements are, yet others applaud their chairman. He has done tremendously well, but I still want him to do better. In terms of roads, there are some roads the local government can be able to patch, not waiting for the state government or the federal government. So, I... yeah, you know quite well that in Abia State, Umunuchi, the cases of kidnapping, robbery, and other things, they, are, they increase there. But since it came in and the monitoring and making sure that the security agencies are their post doing what they are supposed to do at the right time, has helped to limit the level of kidnapping. The masses also gave words of advice on possible areas of focus. At the grassroots, that is where we have the populace. And any little thing do, done there that affects their life, you are already uplifting the life of the generality of the people in Nigeria. So I encourage the mayors to take their work serious. Because if, if it's not up to him to do like that, he should do the one he can be able to do, so that when the next person comes in, it will be easier for the next person to achieve that. The once they have started, let them make sure that they finish it before they leave the office. If there is any place they have to touch, let them touch that place. The local government over the years has been a tool in the hands of the state governors who decide those who occupy the seats as chairman through appointments and even elections, which makes their claims of giving autonomy to the chief executive of the council areas appear unbelievable. In Omar Hefo News Central, Chinwe Ugele. Keynote speakers from the Niger Delta Development Commission's recently concluded retreat in Igodak Bede, Akwaibum State, located in Nigeria's south, have tasked the board and management of the commission to embrace change and radical reform in order to achieve its key objectives, which include uplifting, uplifting the lives of residents in the region. Now, this was during the second day of the retreat aimed at helping the commission align its objectives with President Bola Tinmu's renewed hope agenda. With more, here's our correspondent, Amadine Ui. It's day two of the ongoing retreat by the border management of the Niger Delta Development Commission. Keynote speakers took time to highlight obstacles affecting the commission from achieving its core objectives in the last few years. One of the biggest problems the NDDC has suffered has been disruptions in its board and management. The board have never been allowed to complete their tenure. Average would have been about two years. In between, outside the laws of the NDDC, governing the NDDC, people were appointed as uh, caretaker managers, sole administrators. All of those were very disruptive. Your mandate is clear. And so when we have conflict, we are looking at the why the conflict, because the conflict mitigates achievement of the objectives of your mandate. Participants here should have a deep understanding of what conflict management is about, and also the role of conflict management in value creation. Some of them gave far-reaching recommendations needed to align the commission with President Balatinubu's renewed hope agenda. The disruption, I think, accounts for why we have so many uncompleted projects. One management comes in, they dump the things that had happened before. We should move from transaction to transformation and make this nation great for our children and for our children's children. Let's see what we can do to help. 
at any point in time, we need to have clear mechanism in place that will give all the stakeholders the comfort that the decisions that are being taken by, by NDDC are taken in the best interest of the people. They say the commission must embrace reforms in its quest to distinguish itself and ensure it meets the high expectations of citizens from the sub-region. In Akwaibon for New Central, I am Amadin Uyi. Still in West Africa, the Fifth Legislative Echoes Parliament has rounded off its session in Freetown, the capital of Sierra Leone. Members of the Parliament urged lawmakers expected to comprise the Sixth Legislative or Legislature to build on the successes of the outgoing Parliament. Once again, here's Amadine Uyi. It was a closing speech from the Speaker of the ECOWAS Parliament, but also a parting word to other members of the regional lawmaking body. I would therefore like to congratulate us on our meetings. I am all the more delighted that in such a short time, you have been able to make proposals which are in line with the ideals of our founding fathers, namely to promote cooperation and integration among our diverse peoples. The Speaker of the ECOWAS Parliament commended lawmakers for their support and efforts aimed at bringing succor to members of the community. In a short while, I will hand over the Speakership of Parliament, which you entrusted to me in accordance with Article 24, 1A of the Supplementary Act relating to the enhancement of the powers of the ECOWAS Parliament. I therefore take this opportunity offered me to show you once again my profound gratitude and my deep appreciation for the trust you placed in my modest person to preside over the destiny of the community parliament. While apologizing to those whom he had offended within the four years of his tenure, he urged members of the parliament not to forget the clamor for direct elections into the regional lawmaking body saying it will improve parliamentary functions, debates, and oversight. Having placed at the center of my mandate the issue of election of MPs by universal suffrage and having worked with all of my strength so the MPs who take seat in the ECOWAS parliament are elected by universal suffrage in their countries of origin. Some members of the parliament gave a word of advice to the sixth and incoming parliament saying there's much they can leverage on, especially the success of the fifth legislature. My major recommendation with six thousand is to really look at the successes of the current legislature in terms of advocating for adult suffrage and making sure that they put it to reality. Let us have a direct election, represent the people directly from the community, not um, par parliamentary representation now, but direct from the countries to represent them and equals Parliament. Sometimes people say, ah, this is a co-ass parliament. What are they doing? We've handled issues. This last one we had, we discussed issues about mining, illegal mining, which you see cross across West Africa. And if we're able to come together and have a common, uh, a, a common way of attacking illegal mining to help the finances of, uh, of the sub-region. The extraordinary session in Freetown, Sierra alone is the last session for members of the fifth legislature of the ECOWAS parliament. Citizens of the sub-region will be hoping that the sixth legislature continues with the same tempo initiated by the outgoing parliament. In Abuja for New Central, I am Amadin Uyi. You welcome back. Let's head over to the north of the continent where Egypt is threatening to renounce its peace pact with Israel, claiming that fighting in Gaza may compel the closing of the territory's major route for humanitarian supplies. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu stated that the four-month old fight against the militant Palestinian group Hamas will not be won without sending troops into Rafah, raising possibility of suspending the Camp David Accords, a pillar of regional stability for almost 50 years. Over half of Gaza's population of 2.3 million have fled to Rafah, on the border with Egypt to escape fighting in other areas and are packed into sprawling tent camps and UN-run shelters near the border. Egypt fears a mass influx of hundreds of thousands of Palestinian refugees who may never be allowed to return. 
back to the Palestinian region. In Southern Africa, ESCOM, South Africa's state-owned electricity utility, has described or declared the implementation of a stage 5 load shedding effective midnight, rather, at 12 noon on Sunday. This decision comes as the company grapples with maintaining a stable power supply across the nation. A recent statement ESCOM revealed that it actively replenished its pumped storage dam levels over the past 48 hours, thereby facilitating the return of some generation units to service. Stage 5 load shedding entails a significant reduction in electricity supply, with consumers expected to endure prolonged periods without power. However, ESCOM assured the public that it actively monitors the power system and provides timely updates regarding any changes to the shadow of load shedding. Let's stay in South Africa, where thousands of supporters of Economic Freedom Fighters Party attended its manifesto launch ahead of the upcoming South African elections. Uh, party leader and Commander-in-Chief Jiras Malema lashed out at President Cyril Ramaphosa, who is the leader of the ruling African National Congress, saying that the president was standing in the way of South Africa's transformation and hindering its progress. He went on to say that South Africans must continue to seek peace for the people of the Palestine. Some 27.5 million registered South Africans will vote for a new parliament, who will then in turn vote in a new president. The South African election is to be held on a date between May and August. Of the organization in South Africa that is 100% black and African owned, and no white man can claim this organization except black. We are fighting black people who are standing on our way, being black outside and white inside. Those are sellouts. Like Ramaphosa, when we fight him, we make no apology. We know that we are fighting an evil spirit of a white settler inside Ramaphosa. The people of Palestine are not against the Jewish nation. The people of Palestine do not want to kill Jewish women and children. The people of Palestine want their self-determination. If there is anyone who... Secretary General of the International Maritime Organization, Arsenio Dominguez, has stressed the need for dialogue between all parties to de-escalate the situation in the Red Sea. Since mid-November 2023, Yemen's Iran-backed Houthi rebels have launched dozens of attacks on cargo ships in the Red Sea in solidarity with the Palestinians in the Israeli Hamas war. Despite retaliatory strikes by the U.S. and U.K., the Houthi government still launches attacks firing at the U.S. ship Star Nasia and the U.K. vessel Morning Tide. This happened on Tuesday. Es que nuestra labor y para mí es seguir conversando con todas las partes, apoyando los procesos, los operativos dentro de la organización para los buques y los ya de alto nivel, cualquier contribución que podamos dar a las Naciones Unidas. Y buscar de alguna forma que las partes sigan uh, intercambiando ideas, opiniones y conversando para que no escale la situación más de lo que ya ha sucedido y que regresemos y volvamos a lo que es un medio marino uh, libre de comercio, uh, libre de retos y de situaciones peligrosas. Yo siempre soy positivo y la realidad es que la industria marítima siempre ha demostrado que es bastante reciente para estas situaciones difíciles y es importante reconocer...